Yes, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton. Every week, bringing you a communication professional, we have a conversation that you will benefit from. In fact, we all know that powerful communication is central to your success in business, impacting your management, your sales, your marketing, your customer service, your morale, and yes, your profits too. And so that's why every week we bring on an expert to share with us some tips that will help us in our business. Today, very privileged to welcome for the second appearance on the Biz Communication Show, Dawn Eccles, a brief overview of her professional bio. Dawn is the owner and, and the executive director of Dawning Phoenix. She has enjoyed a very diverse career professionally. She's taught classical music, broke sales records in the insurance industry, worked in customer service sales and marketing as a consultant. And I'll add on to that as an avocation, she's a splendid water skier, which I have been able to watch on YouTube. In recent months, Dawn has become a very popular speaker at colleges, talking to students about abuse in dating relationships. And she has more speeches on this coming up, a very vital, timely, and helpful topic. Again, it's a real privilege to welcome with us today, Dawn Eccles. Hello, Dawn. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, and what a timely topic we have today because we're going to be thinking about the fact that there have been so many tragic international situations which have come to our attention in recent months. Just for a brief overview of them, I jotted down California fires, 42 died, 6,000 homes destroyed, Puerto Rico, the hurricane there, only 25% of power restored so far. Now, the Florida Keys uh, had hurricane impact. Houston, Texas, with Hurricane Harvey, it was called an underwater metropolis because 52 inches of rain fell so quickly. You cannot overlook the Las Vegas shooting with 58 dead and 500 injured. Uh, Don, the question that I would pose to start with, you're a professional counselor. So to start with, I want to ask you, does paying attention to all of these items, does that, could it affect our work performance? Absolutely. That level of negativity, um, and, and negativity is the wrong word, it's tragedy, which is why you're bringing it up. It's a tragedy that based on our exposure to it and our knowledge of it uh, does affect us. It's, it's um, tragic events that we feel in many cases, uh, certainly with nature, that we feel we have no control over. I'm wondering, do we, are we having more events of this type? Or as you look back over your lifetime and your career, is it just that they're publicize more. We have so many more ways to talk about and to show these events. What do you think? I think the availability of communication. I'm even thinking when you had mentioned about over the course of career, and then I want to make a comment over the course of history, really, as we know it. Um, you know, humankind, as long as they've been recording their own history. But certainly, if we think back to the times that we've started in our careers, those of us who've been working more than 20, 25 years, there was a time when long distance calls, my dad talks about receiving a long distance call from overseas from someone he went to school with when he was still in school. And it was a very big deal. It was this very expensive, you know, I mean, I can't even comprehend of how much and what that was like because by the time I started working, I had access to toll-free lines and a corporate job and I spoke long distance, but that was unusual. It was tended to be limited to work and I had to have a long distance calling card when I traveled. And then you had pagers and then you had cell phones and then you had smartphones and now we have social media. So definitely the availability of communicating all kinds of news has become from this 
very complicated and expensive method. And even then, when my father was young, that was very much a big technology to now at the touch of a button. I'm chuckling as I <laughs> hear you talk about when long distance calls were something very special. In fact, if someone said to you, you've got a long distance call, you'd run down the hallway <laughs> to, to take that call. That was so exciting and it was so rare. And many people would not be aware that um, in those days, if say you were talking from a payphone, you would put in coins and after three minutes, the operator would come on and say, your three minutes are up. You have to deposit some more coins. As you're saying, now that we have cell phones and now that we have social media, the instant something tragic happens, there's no way it's local any longer. There's no way it's talked about among just a few people, it impacts so many. Now, Don, uh, another question. In a previous appearance on the Biz Communication Show, you and I talked about the value of self-talk. And of course, we all do talk to ourselves. Okay, in the midst of these calamities, which I just mentioned, and which we're all still painfully aware of, Give us some advice about what would be the wrong kind of self-talk and what would be the constructive, helpful kind of self-talk under these circumstances. That's a really good question, Bill. And, it, and I like how you talk about the self-talk piece because one of the first things and when, we, uh, when you pose this topic, one of the first things that came to mind is back in when I was in sales, um, the million dollar clubs that salespeople, you know, that all these kind of growth, you, you work to be part of a think tank, um, you're around people of similar interest and that are helping promote your, your success on the job. So you share ideas and you share challenges and, and it's kind of a collaborative effect, even if you are competing with some of your teammates. And one of the things that happens and one of the things they would say, and it sounds very in a sense, almost harsh. And so I'm so glad you brought up self-talk because I'm going to mention that first and then I'm going to talk about self-talk. The first thing is, is they would say, stop watching the news. And they would talk about the impact of negativity and on what it does to your mindset when you're trying to accomplish and when you're trying to create a positive environment for yourself. And there's a lot that people talk about with that because in social psychology, when you talk about that, the news tends to focus on bad news because that's what sells. And so unfortunately, that means that we are exposed to 10 times more of a emphasis on negative as opposed to the positive. You're reminding me there, Don, of Andrew Weil, who said the same thing. I watched a, a program of his on public television quite a few years back. And the very first point he made, if you want to achieve serenity and stability, stop watching the news. Now, this doesn't mean that we remain uninformed. I mean, my gosh, every night before I turn in, I go to Google News and I browse it and I know what people are talking about. I know what's going on. But what this is saying to us, I believe is, Yes, you can be informed, but you use the word saturated. Suppose you watched news from the time you got home from work till the time you went to bed. How could you keep but thinking that everything is wrong in the world and there's no good anywhere? Exactly. There's no exposure to those positive things, the everyday heroes, the people in our community that are doing good things. The, that's why the power of a story can be so important. And it's why your conversation about self-talk is important in this topic. Because one of the things that strikes me is some people would not be able to do what you're doing, or I would not recommend that if they were a client, of looking even at Google News where you can pick and choose before they go to bed because that's what they go to bed with. However, in your case, you may have a way of thinking and your self-talk may be such that this is how you stay informed. You put this in the context of your life experience and you bring a lot of positivity into your life and in a, in, a, in a way of how you have, where you do your career or your communication or those kinds of things. So self-talk 
that and then so when you brought this topic up when we talk about self-talk first of all self-talk is a script it's an automatic script that runs in our brain like a train okay and we have all in our beliefs often ones that we're not necessarily aware of are reflected in that self-talk so when you mentioned Andrew Weil I thought about Wayne Dyer Louise Hay some of your other um, writers and self-help people now people are talking about Brene Brown and how much that helps them when they become aware of how to be in the world in a way that's loving and at the same time self-protective for lack of a better word so if our self-talk is negative and we expose ourselves to negative then we're just amplifying that and from an evolutionary standpoint mind focuses on negativity our brains are hardwired for that because it's an evolutionary advantage if you weren't paying attention to threats from the outside world in hunter-gatherer societies you could get killed <laughs> that goes back to primitive times doesn't it absolutely so that's it's it's the way we're wired so we have to be aware of that and know that that's an it, it's it, we're designed that way to protect ourselves and to survive but then we we live in a different world now than the way that we've evolved to this point so we have to think about what do i need to do and what beliefs are being reflected in my self-talk what am I, what am, become more consciously aware of that and then become aware of how much we're saturated with that input and what sources are we receiving from that? So our community now is global as opposed to local. And that's why we're affected by all these tragedies. It, they are shared human experiences and tragedy has existed for thousands of years and at times much in some ways, you know, people died in much greater numbers in locally, but people weren't aware that that happened globally. And so I think tragedy is a shared human experience, and that's why it resonates with us when we hear about it. Uh, one of my favorites that I've mentioned to you before in the realm of self-talk is Shad Helmstetter. Mm -hmm. With his terrific book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, so while we're still on this topic of self-talk, when we look at all of the bad news, and yes, we are going to be aware of it, even if we don't watch four hours of news at night, we are going to be aware of it. There are some destructive uh, items that we could say to ourselves. What, what should we be saying to ourselves in the midst of all these global challenges? I think sometimes, Bill, it's about recognizing, and this is the hard part. Uh, I have a friend that did a great uh, blog herself about the illusion of control, that illusion of safety, that we all want to feel safe. And I asked her if I could share it on my blog because it was so powerfully eloquent about this idea of how fearful it can, it can be to feel as though we don't have control. And so one way we can exercise a certain level of control over our own environment is through being aware of how we talk to ourselves and what our automatic thoughts are and then working to change those i think it was shad helmstetter who, who and i know it's been others that talk about take seven positive thoughts to counteract one negative one and if we talk about being saturated with negativity from media not necessarily social media because that tends to be the community of people that share and then certain things go viral right as we call it now but if we're talking about straight kind of delivery of what pops up on our um, favorite search engine, what we see on TV and what we hear on any kind of radio or even on like a Google news feed, there's still going to be that focus on negativity. And so we've got to work to counteract that through these positive kinds of things. And one of the ways we can do that is say, okay, what do I have control of versus what I really don't have control of? And the rest of it is an illusion. And so sometimes we have to kind of work. And this is where spirituality and faith and um, religious practices come in handy for people and why they've been around for so long, regardless of which faith or whether or none that people might have is this idea that maybe there's, there's comfort in the idea that there might be some sort of grand design, even if it's just the laws of nature. But we have to kind of accept, okay, this is what I have control of. And this is what I don't. We can't control how other people behave. We can only control how we react or behave. We can't control what other people think and often what they say, but we can control what we think and say. We can control what we say easily, more easily than what we think. But then if we become aware of it and we work to kind of counteract that through more positive input, so very selectively seeking out people who look at positive ways of making an impact in their community, 
when you were talking about social media and, and the saturation of, of all this tragedy, I was reminded of the State Farm ad, and I absolutely love that advertisement that's been on television, and I haven't seen it in a, in a month or so. And it has all of those images that we're bombarded with. And, the, and it shows all these people. And then it shows someone walking into the Boys and Girls Clubs of America and saying, let's do something. Terrific. Isn't that a great, it's just wonderful because it says we're saturated with all this tragedy, but yet then State Farm's challenged by supporting this ad. It says, okay, now walk in somewhere in your community and, and do something about it. Yes, and in the community where I live, Gainesville, Georgia, there must be at least 40, maybe 50, very worthwhile nonprofit agencies that are serving the needy in many, many ways. That's what we really could be thinking about rather than the colossal, terrible news-making headlines that naturally might depress us. Okay, in our remaining couple of minutes, Don, we've naturally covered self-talk. Think now and, and give us some advice, please, about our talk with others. We're, we've, we're thinking about the workplace. Okay, let's say that we have learned how to handle all these bad things with affirmative self-talk, remembering the blessings we have in life, the good things that have happened to us, all our privileges. But we go to work and at coffee break or even during the work day otherwise, everybody brings up the latest news bad item. What should we do? That's a great, really great following thought because self-talk is not where it stops. It, it goes from there to changing it, to exposure to positivity, and to um, some sort of thoughtful action that resonates for us, hopefully in our own communities, whether it's through the 50 charities that are great in our Gainesville community, since I have a practice there as well, so you and I share that community. But the other thing is when we do talk with people at work, the first thing I would say is kind of be aware of the person who's speaking to you and take a moment, and then we, sometimes we don't do this, especially if we're stressed, we're in a hurry, or we ourselves are struggling that day, and that happens. It can be just because you're tired. But if we can kind of tune in for a moment and be more mindful of the person that's speaking to us, what is their mood state, and how is this affecting them? Are they wanting to simply have a conversation with a coworker, and they want to connect, and they want to acknowledge this tragedy, and they simply are basically greeting you and, and having a conversation, and they don't want to be ignoring it or seem insensitive to it, okay? A person who might be more deeply affected by it may do one of two things. They're very moved and possibly upset or distressed, or they actually don't talk about it at all because they don't want to get upset at work. But when someone speaks to us at work, we might first kind of pause, take that moment to sort of be aware instead of just ourselves, which I think can happen with all of us as we're so bombarded and saturated and say, what is this person's purpose or what are, what are they, just at least what they feel so that you can, that's, I think that'd be the most powerful way to converse at work effectively is reflect how they feel and acknowledge that. And that way you can create a connection that doesn't have to be deep and long and because you're at work and this is a business person that you're working with and the job is to get back to the um, accomplishments and tasks at hand. But then to just kind of reflect that in a way that's useful without dwelling in it too much. And then to kind of talk about what your approach is at that point. First, make a very empathic and, and understanding response and that shared concern. And then maybe from something positive or action, but not in a way. The one thing I was thinking about when we were, I was preparing for this topic is if we focus too much on what we're trying to do to kind of respond and not be taken down almost like by the tidal wave of tragedy. If we respond in a way that shuts down the negativity we're working so hard to deal with, then we shut down the person in front of us. And that's why your question is so good because we do have to try to take that moment. These are people we can come together with. This is where a coworker may choose to go and volunteer in Texas to help clean up from flood. Someone else may take in foster animals when there's not a home and they can't take them somewhere. Someone else may send money because they're busy with a 70 hour a week job or they are babysitting grandchildren or children or they're 
busy with the responsibilities right there in their own circle that they should not neglect, okay? And so when we do that, then each of us finds what we can do and then we can share that with that other person without shutting down where they're at and then try to find a kind of, for lack of a better word, a loving and kind way to sort of challenge movement in a good direction if there's time and that's appropriate. Otherwise, we've got to kind of just acknowledge it, stay focused, and then connect and then go back to our desk and do what we need to do. Don, I know I speak for all of our viewers and for our listeners on podcast when I say that you have brought very valuable and helpful information to us as a professional counselor who has wonderful insight into how we are to react to these unwelcomed big events. So I know people want your contact information. Would you give that to us, please? Yes, thank you for asking. My practice is based out of Gainesville, Georgia. I have a website, dawningphoenix.com, spelled P-H-O-E-N-I-X. And my telephone number, which can be called if you want to make an appointment, is 678-965-9591. Thank you, Don. And since you've given your contact information, I'm happy to share mine. Biz Communication Guy. So logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. I welcome your visiting there, reviewing the services that I can provide. Sign up for my newsletter and podcast and I will be very happy to talk with you about how I can assist you in your business communication. Again, many thanks to Don Eccles. Any parting words, Don? I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about such an important topic as we all do find ways to effectively make a difference in our community in the face of shared tragedies. Thank you, and thank all of you who joined us for this edition of the Biz Communication Show. Be with us next week when, again, I will bring you a, an outstanding communication professional. Thank you.